my focus in uh, graduate school and my, my research since then has, um, I've spent a lot of time on energy issues. Um, a number of years ago, I um, wrote a, a paper on um, mercury emissions from coal-fired power plants. Uh, the EPA was making noises about regulating mercury emissions. And uh, I was reminded of this when I listened to an, the, the, that three-hour podcast where Joe Rogan interviewed RFK Jr. And uh, I was listening to this podcast on a road trip earlier this summer. And it's very interesting, um, thought-provoking. Um, but uh, he was talking about his, his early environmentalist days, and uh, he made some comments about a few things, and one of them was um, on mercury in, uh, in fish that came from coal-fired power plants. And I thought, well, you know, I don't know much about some of the things that he's talking about in this, in this interview, but I do know something about that, and he's, he's wrong. Uh, so it kind of colored my, my view of, of some other things that, that RFK Jr. had to say. Um, but I've got a, a, an interest in, in thinking through this from an Austrian perspective, and one of the best things we can do here when, a, when tackling a subject like this is realize what we don't know. Was it, I think Mark Twain said, it's not what you don't know that is bad, it's what you think you know that isn't true, or something to that effect. And, and that's, that's the case with a lot, of, a, a lot of these energy issues. There's a lot of things that we think we know that, that, um, that we actually don't. So I want to talk a little bit about efficiency. Um, and from the Austrian perspective, we have to remember what we can't count, what we don't know about costs and benefits. We, we can't figure out what is socially efficient for an entire society. We just don't have that information available. And to recognize that is to move a long way toward understanding uh, where we are on things like energy choices. So if, if I'm sure some of you are kind of pro-fossil fuels and some of you are like pro-nuclear and other people maybe pro-wind or something, I don't know. But we, you can, you can uh, advocate for one of these things, but you can't legitimately say that one of these is more socially efficient than the other. The whole idea of social efficiency from the Austrian perspective is, uh, is nonsensical. Um, it, look at these two cars. So you've got like a 1970 or something uh, Ford Bronco there and looks like a Nissan uh, electric something. And um, by the way, did you see this about the ship that's on fire off and uh, drifting off the coast of Europe, I think, and it's got a whole bunch of People are saying maybe this is an electric car that caught fire. I don't know. Anyway, so um, uh, anyway, so most people, if you if you show them these two pictures and you say, well, which car is more efficient? They're going to point to the electric car and say, well, that one's more efficient. Well, it may be more energy efficient in some sense that it consumes less energy to go a mile than the other vehicle does. But uh, efficiency depends on your objectives. Uh, how, how easy is it for you to get your objective accomplished? And that is an individual subjective decision. So um, if my objective is to go over Cinnamon Pass in Colorado uh, outside URA, um, I'm not going to pick the electric Nissan. Uh, that's, that's not going to make a lot of sense. It's not going to be very efficient at accomplishing that goal. So uh, efficiency depends on your objectives. And if we, if we have different objectives from one person to another, we're going to have uh, different ideas about what's most efficient. Um, smaller cars may be more fuel efficient, but they may be less human life efficient. We know that smaller cars, you're more likely to get into a, um, you're more likely to have a fatal accident if you're in a smaller car versus a larger vehicle, uh, all other things being equal, mass tends to protect you if you're in a car accident. Uh, I came to appreciate this on Sunday. I was in a car accident on the way down here, and uh, my car took a beating, and I didn't, and that was great. So um, I, I, I appreciated the, uh, the, the safety of my vehicle, didn't really um, care about fuel efficiency was when I was in that accident. So, um, 
This is a word you may hear if you're around Austrian uh, circles for any time, uh, catalaxy. Catalactics is the study of monetary exchanges. Uh, in a catalaxy, there is no overall hierarchy of goals. There are only the separate objectives of individuals. Economic efficiency is compatible with Austrian economics only insofar as it applies to the assessments of whether the means chosen by the individuals are consistent with the accomplishment of the ends chosen by those individuals. So to the Austrian, you can't, you can't engage in interpersonal comparisons of values of ends. Uh, you know, I, as an Austrian economist, I can't say, well, my ends have more value than your ends, They're, your goals. There's, there's no way to say this. Catalactic efficiency occurs when economic efficiency is promoted by an institutional environment that pr ensures that property rights are secure. If you have an institutional environment which, uh, in which property rights are secure, then that's going to promote the discovery and use of information uh, for the accomplishment of individual plans. And that's what we mean by uh, catalactic efficiency. You've, as an individual, you've got the ability to seek out your goals, your goals, not the ones that I think you should have, but the ones you have, and then put together the means to accomplish that goal. If that happens to be a 1970 Ford Bronco, or if that happens to be a uh, you know, 2023 uh, Nissan electric thing, then that's, that's up to you. Um, and so catalactic efficiency takes into account the fact we can't judge the individual ends being pursued by the participants in the market. So uh, there's only the separate objectives of the individual. We don't have any ability to compare uh, ends across individuals from, from an Austrian perspective. Now, I, I can, on other grounds, you know, uh, let's say moral grounds, I can, I can say something about what I think about the ends of other individuals, but not, not from an uh, Austrian perspective. So if we're looking at institutional environments, this is one of my favorite pictures to show to students. Um, you see here a, a valley, and on the right side of the valley, you see wooded terrain. It's lush and green, and on the left side of the valley, it's kind of barren. Uh, looks like the trees have been cut down, maybe. Um, well, as, as it turns out, um, the right side uh, is the Dominican Republic, and the left side is Haiti, which approximately equal, uh, equally share uh, an island. And uh, if you look at the Economic Freedom Index, of these two countries, you see that um, the rank of the Dominican Republic is a lot higher than the rank of, the, uh, of, of Haiti next door. Um, the, the terrain is very similar, the climate is very similar, uh, but the institutional environment has translated into very different, uh, you might say, land use patterns across these two countries. If you look at, not just at the index as a whole, but you drill down to the component of the index that is about the protection of property rights, which I had mentioned earlier, uh, you see that the score for the Dominican Republic is a good bit higher at 4.82 than the property rights protection score for Haiti at 2.79. So uh, roughly what this, this boils down to is that, you know, you cut down a tree on somebody's, somebody else's property in Haiti, the consequences for you are likely to be less serious than if you cut down a tree on someone's property in the Dominican Republic. So you're going you're gonna to see this kind of translate into uh, visually different environmental outcomes. Now, I, I can't say from an Austrian perspective, trees are better than clear land. Okay, that's, it just depends on your purposes. But I can say that you can observe people have not been able, if they presumably desire to make their land productive, it's a lot harder to get something productive out of land if you don't have secure property rights that are protected on that land. So Roy Cardato, who's uh, an Austrian economist, has written uh, um, some great stuff on environmental issues from an Austrian perspective. He says, look, efficiency is an individual goal-seeking problem. It is not a value maximization problem. And this is where we begin to see that divergence between the Austrian view of the environment and the mainstream economist view of the environment, even those 
mainstreamers that are kind of generally pro-market, you'll still see some of these kinds of uh, differences. So we see conflicts over the use of scarce goods, many of which are, you might say, environmental goods. But the Austrian does not try to assess the value of these alternative uses. I, I, I can't say as an Austrian that using the air for me to, uh, to generate a, um, a product of some kind, um, maybe I'm using the air as a, a dumping ground for some kind of gaseous emission that comes from my production process, I can't say that that's necessarily better or worse than using the air for some other uh, purpose. We can't uh, add up values. We can't compare these across individuals outside of a, uh, a market, which allows for some of that. And that's why uh, these kind of considerations are, are why Murray Rothbard uh, said that when we, when we come to environmental issues, we have to dispense with the idea that we can compare efficiencies or we can somehow minimize costs and choose a course of action based on some kind of social efficiency. So um, uh, let, me, let me just point out a couple of problems here that emerge when we think about environmental regulation. When I, when I talk with students about environmental problems, it, it's a kind of a knee-jerk reaction that if we have an environmental problem, then we need to have some kind of regulation from government to solve that problem. And uh, the whole idea of, of maybe uh, securing people's property rights is uh, kind of a distant thought, uh, which I, I try to re remind them how powerful and important that is. But um, Art Carden has said that the information that we would need to know whether a particular regulation works quite literally does not exist. And the key difference between firms and governments is that firms have market tests for their decisions. Governments do not. Uh, the second problem is incentives. So you're, if you're going to regulate to try to solve what you perceive to be an environmental problem, then you're using government employees, elected officials and bureaucrats and so on, to, to try to solve this problem. And it's a quite bad assumption to think that these individuals uh, have environmental quality at the top of their list of, of uh, objectives. Their incentive structure is affected by their own personal goals. Um, so elected officials aren't selfless, publicly interested beings any more than we would assume the rest of humanity to be. And so you might see a, an elected official who says, well, I, I, I advocate for this particular regulation. And you say, well, why, why, do you, why do you think that regulation is appropriate? And of course, what's going to come out of that elected official's mouth is something to the effect that, well, I care about the environment and I care about our posterity and so on. But what's, what, what you may not hear about is the fact that some large industry engaged in some lobbying and gave the politician a very large campaign contribution because the large industry knows that the regulation is going to end up uh, penalizing their competition. And this happens all the time with environmental regulation. It's very useful for that purpose because it's got this kind of veneer, this, 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 this surface appeal of doing something that's that's uh, beneficial for everybody. We, you know, we want cleaner air and so on. But uh, underneath the surface of this is a lot of regulation that not only may not in reality work to produce cleaner air, but also has the effect of suppressing some kind of competition. Uh, furthermore, political incentives may discourage a long-term view. If you are a, an elected official, you've got your term in office, and maybe you'll get reelected. Maybe you'll get reelected multiple times, but your time horizon is somewhat affected by that that limit on how long you're going to be in office. And if you can extract uh, resources and use those resources immediately, you have a perhaps better chance of getting reelected by people who would benefit from the use of those of those resources now. Uh, and so to think that somehow politicians take the long view, whereas a private sector firm is going to take a short-sighted view is, is uh, I, I think, got it backwards. Uh, you see some countries where there's a dictatorial regime, and their incentive is to just 
get as much uh, out of their um, natural resource endowment as they can uh, immediately in order to perpetuate their power and, their, um, and the power of their friends. Um, I'm going to get a little bit technical here in the next few slides because I want to talk about some of the Austrian criticisms of mainstream environmental policies. When I was in, in, in college and then later in graduate school, <clears throat> the idea of using uh, markets, harnessing markets, as they would say, to um, solve environmental problems was very much uh, uh, in vogue and uh, still is to, to a large extent. Um, and now it's pretty standard treatment in, in principles textbooks and other economics textbooks to see some discussion of how you can, you can use, you know, here we have a, a market-oriented or market-centered way of resolving environmental problems, and one of these is tradable permits. Um, so one of the best-known examples of this is the EPA's use of uh, tradable emissions permits for sulfur dioxide, which was a program started in the early 90s. The first auction of these uh, permits occurred in March of 1993, and sulfur dioxide is a chemical compound that's produced when you burn uh, mainly coal. And um, it's, it's linked to uh, some environmental problems like uh, acid rain. It reacts with, I can't remember what, in the atmosphere and precipitates um, and so it's, it's something that the EPA is interested in controlling. Um, and so they, the EPA said, okay, we're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna, we've decided that 275,000 tons of sulfur dioxide is the appropriate amount of sulfur dioxide to allow into the atmosphere. And we're gonna sell off a permit. Each permit says that I can, I can emit a ton of this SO2. So the permits in the auction turned out to have a market-ish price of about $76. Um, so the EPA collected $21 million selling off these, these permits. And the idea was, well, this is better than what we have been doing. What we have been doing is just telling coal-fired power plants, you have to cut your emissions to X. And they tell each coal-fired power plant, you have to each cut your emissions to this this specific amount. Um, and, and they might even specify the technology that has to be used to accomplish that result. This is called command and control regulation. And economists and a number of other people said, well, you know, this is not really efficient. If you wanted to get that result, then you would allow, um, you, you would focus the uh, emissions reductions on those plants that can cut their emissions cheaply and you would allow the other plants that can't cut their emissions cheaply to emit more. And so the auction process was supposed to allow for that to kind of naturally occur, where you get the emissions cuts where it's cheap, and you don't get the emissions cuts where it's not cheap. And, and so economists are like, oh, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. We should do that. Uh, you know, you had cases like one coal-fired power plant where they stopped construction on a $350 million scrubber, um, which was supposed to remove some of their emissions, and they bought some permits instead. Well, the firms that they bought permits from um, were reducing their emissions more than they would have otherwise in order to um, uh, be able to have excess permits to sell. So it, it seemed like to a lot of a lot of people that this is oh this is harnessing markets this is this is a great thing unfortunately there's a massive calculation problem here um, we we don't know, in general we don't know what overuse or underuse of resources means we don't know what overusing the air as a dumping ground for waste means um, we don't know what, in order to say overuse or underuse, you, not, you, you have to know what the optimal use is. Where's that information come from? I mean, the EPA came up with this 275,000 figure for SO2 permits. Where do they get this number? And that's where I think it's, it's a good thing to remind uh, uh, regulatory bureaucracies, and uh, they're, they're probably pretty intransigent on these kinds of things, but at least remind people who um, don't make their living off of off of this regulation of the problems with this kind of thing. So we, we can't really assume that we know what that optimal rate looks like. If you've taken a, um, 
I guess you, I would sometimes teach this in a principal's class. I might sometimes wait until maybe an elective or an intermediate level class before I get to some of this. <clears throat> but the standard treatment of this in a textbook for any kind of externality, and here we're talking about air pollution, but this is, uh, this is classic kind of externality theory from the mainstream. You'll see this kind of diagram where you've got uh, the marginal private benefit of uh, producing some kind of output, uh, output like electricity from a coal-fired power plant or paper from a paper mill. And so uh, you've got that, that benefit to the producer, and then you've got uh, marginal private cost, or MPC, which is the cost to the producer of producing that electricity or producing that paper or whatever it is they're producing. And then you've got the cost to the rest of society, which is depicted here as the gap between the marginal private cost and the marginal social cost, or MSC. So the MSC would be the cost not only to the private producer, but also to anyone who has to smell the bad smell from the paper mill, the cost to anyone who's got to breathe the particulates from the coal-fired power plant, anybody who's got to um, you know, deal with whatever the emissions might be from that production process. And so the economics textbook treatment of this says, oh, well, see, uh, the market is producing here at, let me see if I can get my laser to work. There we go. No, it doesn't show up on the screen. Anyway, so you've got the uh, Q star, which is the, um, the uh, sorry, QM, uh, which is the market produced level of output. But then the textbook says, well, that's inefficient because as we can see, the ideal level of output is actually Q star. Uh, we needed to have less output in order to be efficient, but we, we ended up producing too much because, see, we relied on that market, and we know the markets fail, and so uh, here's, here's that, that problem we've got to somehow resolve. And so the, um, uh, the, the textbook goes on to say, well, see, uh, we generated this, this loss because we're overproducing. We're producing quantities of electricity or paper or something where the the costs of producing that paper, including all the externality costs, are greater than the benefits of producing that paper. And so now we've got a real problem uh, of, of inefficiency. So um, then they say, okay, well, let's, let's, let's figure out how to deal with this. Maybe, and this is one of the older solutions to this, maybe we can just impose a tax on the producer of this good uh, tax on electricity, let's say, or maybe a tax on, oh, I know, carbon, right? You've heard about this, carbon taxes. So uh, this was um, a favorite suggestion of the, um, the old economist Arthur Cecil Pigou. And so this is sometimes known as a Pigouvian tax. And uh, he says, well, all we have to do is figure out what that difference is between what the cost of the producer is and what the cost of the rest of society is and force that producer to think about the cost on everybody else by creating a tax equal to that amount and imposing it on that, on that producer. And then the producer says, oh, well, I don't want to have to pay the tax, so I'm going to cut my produce, uh, production down to uh, Q star, not because I suddenly became a uh, conscientious um, member of society, but because I, I don't want to have to pay the tax. And so the government solved the problem in this case with a tax. Now that, that's, I'm going to get to the problem with that in a minute, but that's, that's one common suggestion, all right? Um, another is, as we said, tradable permits. And the tradable permit says, okay, well, we're not going to impose a tax per se. What we're going to do is we're going to decide where Q star is, and then we're going to create permits in the amount of Q star or the, at least the emissions that are consistent with the Q star output. And then we're going to auction those off. And in the auction process, we're going to have um, the, the price that emerges is going to be a market price. And so see, we're using markets and see how friendly to free markets we are. And uh, so this is, this is going to solve our problem, not by creating a tax, but by creating a limitation on the amount of emissions um, in this industry. Now, um, that is problem, both of these are problematic and for the same reason. They're both problematic because fundamentally we don't know where MSC is and there's no way to find out. We don't know where MSC is. We don't know 
what kind of cost is being imposed on anybody else. Now, the response that I've heard to this uh, from, from some um, people as well, okay, it's not perfect, but at least it's progress, and so let's not make the perfect the enemy of the good. And so we're, we're going to try to at least get something done. Maybe the air will be a little cleaner than it was before. And how can that be a bad thing? Well, okay, first of all, in the, in the spirit of answering a fool according to his folly, um, we, we could make things worse just from the standpoint of the mainstream perspective on this. What if we overshot? What if we thought that... Uh, the estimated marginal social cost was this, uh, this uppermost of these three curves here. So um, in, in such a case, we would have imposed an excessive tax or greatly restricted the number of permits way, beyond, way below what would be optimal. And uh, then we've got a larger deadweight loss than what we had if we had simply left the market alone. That's certainly possible within the framework of the mainstream. So uh, then on top of that, from any kind of um, uh, advantage that you might gain from dead weight loss, you have to uh, remember there's the cost of bureaucracy and enforcement, the cost of waste from the political lobbying that I mentioned earlier, that politicians and bureaucrats are always being kind of lobbied by industries who don't really particularly care where QSTAR is. Uh, if you're an industry that wants to shut down your competition, you don't care about QSTAR. What you care about is shutting down your competition. And if that happens to be QM or QSTAR or QSTAR or wherever else in this, it doesn't matter to you. So you, you want your competition shut down, and the politician who wants to be elected will begin to share your goals um, in, in the interest of, of remaining in office. Uh, so we, we see this, as I said, we see this kind of thing all the time. Um, we saw, for example, I, 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 I may say more about this later, but the oil and gas industry began to flip on the idea of global warming. Um, this was maybe 20, 25 years ago. They had been saying things like, well, you know, global warming is not, doesn't exist or it's not a problem. And by, by the way, I'm, I'm, I'm not trying to get into that issue. I'm just trying to say... This is what the, the, the oil and gas industry had been saying. So they, they began to flip on this and say, oh, yeah, yeah oil and, uh, uh, global warming is, 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 oh, we need to deal with this. It's a real problem. So all of a sudden, you see kind of a shift. Uh, w now, is this because they suddenly began to believe the ecologists and they suddenly began to, to uh, and, you know, they were persuaded now, where, whereas they hadn't been before, or could it be that uh, if you're in the natural gas production business, one of your major competitors, in the, at least in electricity production, is coal. And if you really want to go after coal, coal is um, more vulnerable to an anti-carbon um, regulatory agenda than natural gas is. They're both carbon-based fuels, but coal has um, is a more carbon intensive fuel. So if you're if you're in the natural gas industry and you're trying to grab market share from coal, then having a narrative that says something like uh, you know we need to reduce our carbon emissions would be to your advantage. Uh, maybe the, possibly the same thing with wind power because when the wind's not blowing, uh, you need to have a natural gas generators to spool up and generate electricity as a backup. So if you're in the natural gas industry, you've got an interest in promoting wind. Um, which may sound a little odd, but um, that's, that's certainly a, a motivation you might have. Um, I'm a, not not to, to pass over Rothbard too quickly, but I do want to move on to some other things. Um, let's think about these incentives. We know that government can't know the proper amount of a particular pollutant. Uh, we, we often, I mean, this is standard regulation, though, to say, well, you know, this is the, the maximum allowable amount of PM2.5 or SO2 or NOx or whatever the pollutant is. This is the maximum allowable amount. Well, how do they come up with a number? Um, even if you assume that they are not paying attention to um, cronies and lobbyists and all the rest, uh, 
you, they still don't have the information that they would need. They can't get inside the heads of hundreds of millions of individuals and figure out what their goals are, what the means to those ends might be, and the trade-offs that people are willing to make um, between or among competing goals. So there are all kinds of pressures. I've mentioned a few of these, but um, let me let me think uh, uh, for a few minutes with you about alternative and renewable energy. Um, first of all, there's a lot of confusion about this. I have students say, well, we should promote renewable energy. <clears throat> and uh, the, the should there sometimes takes on a kind of a moral uh, tone. And I, and they, and I say, well, wh why renewable? Well, so that we can have more of it left for later. Um, and uh, so, that, so that it doesn't run out. And I say, well, do you, do you, know, do you know when we would actually run out of coal? Uh, I mean, we're, we're looking at a very long period of time. And uh, so if you're worried about running out, that's not a worry that would be really imminent. Um, you have to think about that. Uh, so, uh, and furthermore, if it's renewable, but if it's extremely expensive, that's not really helping you. Um, it, it just just looking at things from an economic growth perspective, if you if you pursue an energy source that's extremely expensive, simply because uh, it'll still theoretically be uh, uh, available in in 200 years, um, and you slow down economic progress as a result of that, what other kinds of innovations have you slowed down and delayed? Uh, the, the introduction of those innovations because you decided you were going to pursue um, uh, th this renewable energy. And then there's a, just a lot of kind of basic confusion about this. I say, okay, so why do you like renewable energy? Well, because it's low carbon. I mean, you're, you're confusing two very different things here. There are, I mean, what nuclear is essentially zero carbon if you're concerned about that kind of thing, uh, and, and yet it's not renewable. And then there's a lot of the world, I mean, mostly the developing world, which is using things like crop waste, dried animal dung, um, charcoal. All of these things are renewable, but they're not low carbon. And in fact, there's a lot of other pollution associated with the use of these kinds of fuels. So what is it that you're really after here? Um, um, is, it, is it really... Um, renewable for new, renewable sake, or is there some other goal that you're... And so clarifying with people what exactly it is that they, they want is, I think, useful. So this is U.S. primary energy production by major sources. And again, I'll emphasize before we get too much further that um, we, it, taking sides on energy sources from, a, from just a strict Austrian perspective is something we can't we can't do. We can't say, well, uh, you know, Austrian economics, our Austrian economics leads us to prefer nuclear versus coal. Or any, we can't say that. Um, uh, and neither can we say, well, you know, we, we should be pro fossil fuels because we're um, because you know Austrians are 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 pro. Uh, I, I, that, that that that's just not very good reasoning. So um, natural gas is number one on primary energy production as of a couple of years ago, followed by crude oil and then coal and then nuclear and then a number of other things. You notice that wind and hydro are uh, pretty low on that list, but there has been a lot of growth and change. So this is 2015, just in the, just in the seven, no, six years, um, here you can see that natural gas has just exploded in, um, in, in use in the United States. Uh, crude oil as well. Uh, coal has dropped precipitously in that six-year period. Not much change to nuclear, a little bit of uh, change in uh, uh, natural gas plant liquids, and um, some change that looks big in percentage terms, but not real big in absolute terms in things like wind and, 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 uh, and hydro. So coal is still a major energy source in the United States, and this what well, coal is cheap, and that's one of its one of its virtues. It's it's easy to um, easy to uh, to mine. Uh, 
uh, easy to, uh, to convert it into electricity. It doesn't take something really high tech like nuclear power does. And for that reason, some countries that are not as wealthy as the United States prefer to use fuels like coal. Again, I'm not trying to advocate one way or the other on this. I'm just trying to say that if we look at what other countries are, are doing in terms of their energy sources, um, a lot of them are still building a lot of coal-fired uh, power plants, and um, uh, that, that has been controversial, of course, um, as people in, in wealthier countries start wagging their fingers and saying you shouldn't be using so much coal. And, and the re quite, to my mind, a quite reasonable response is, well, you know, if we were as rich as you, maybe we could afford all these, um, these uh, alternatives, but we, we, we're not. Um, so when government begins to insert itself into energy choices, we get all kinds of problems, some of which we can pretty easily anticipate, others we cannot or, or can't so easily anticipate. But uh, it, I, I've observed in some developing countries a, a um, there's, there's been a push mostly directed from outside, from wealthier countries, pushing developing countries to stop using fossil fuels. Not just coal, but any kind of fossil fuel. And they'll, they'll begin to tie uh, foreign aid and grant, uh, grants and other kinds of flows of funds to the abandonment of fossil fuels, or at least the, the severe restriction on the growth of the use of fossil fuels in some of these lower income countries. We still have around three billion people in the world that cook and heat their homes using open fires, using simple stoves that are using uh, biomass like uh, wood or crop waste like I've mentioned before. And this is dangerous. Uh, over four million people die prematurely every year from illness that is attributable to household air pollution from the burning of crop waste, dried animal dung, and, and the like. Uh, that's about 45 times the number dying from natural catastrophes. So when people say, well, you know, the, the developing countries are going to bear most of the burden of global climate change because of natural disasters and so forth, well, you know, they're already dying in very large numbers because they don't have access to electricity and because they don't have access to clean fuels like liquefied petroleum gas. And so if you really wanted to resolve health problems in a developing country, one of the easiest and fastest ways to do that is to improve their energy choices so they're not burning a fire in their living room or kitchen. So that, that lack of access to, uh, to energy is a real uh, uh, problem that in the United States it's almost uh, unheard of. Um, and uh, yet if you look at the death rate from ambient particulate matter in the world, that's the green. It has been declining over the last quarter century or so, but it is still significant. Uh, the death rate from indoor solid fuels is significant um, worldwide. In the United States, uh, now this is a little bit misleading. Notice the scale here, 120 on the top. Notice the scale here, 40 at the top. So we have dramatically changed the scale, so I want you to be aware of that. But notice the death rate from indoor solid fuels in the United States. I mean, it's not even registering, really, on that, on that chart. Here's Haiti. Okay? So death rate from indoor solid fuels is much, much, much higher in Haiti, the poorest country in the Western Hemisphere. So um, if you look at the choices that people are, <clears throat> that people are actually making right now in, the, in, um, in poorer countries, uh, the the um, indoor air pollution problems tend to be concentrated in those low-income nations. And I'm going to skip ahead to something here. I think you get that point. Um, so what's happening is a lot of development finance uh, transfers from outside of these poorer countries. A lot of that development finance has adopted the uh, agenda, the anti-fossil fuel agenda. And again, I, I can't be really anti or pro. I just, 
it, it, but once government starts putting its finger on the scales, you affect people's choices. A former economic advisor in India uh, has called this anti-fossil fuel push carbon imperialism. And the Indian prime minister has complained about a new colonialism in which the developed countries of the world, having already used fossil fuels to reach their industrialized state, are now promoting energy policies that would deny that growth to those poorer nations. Um, so we, we've seen, uh, for example, uh, this is, this is uh, last year, in the midst of fertilizer shortages caused by the war in Ukraine and a growing food crisis, the EU has refused financial investment to help Ghana and other cash-strapped African countries to boost their own domestic fertilizer production, which, by the way, uses a lot of that uses natural gas to produce fertilizer, or develop their fossil energy sources because doing so would be inconsistent with their energy and environmental policies. Formerly a net exporter of electricity, Ghana has experienced complete power blackouts that have left millions uh, without water as well, including irrigation needed to grow food. So if you, if you think about the, in, the impact of environmental policies here in the United States, I mean, I get frustrated because my refrigerator fails because it's got three computer boards in it that are prone to failure and the refrigerator my, my refrigerator that I bought in like 1998 is happily chugging along in my garage keeping my beer cold and the one that I have in my kitchen which is there because it's nice looking and stainless steel fails about every four or five years because it's got uh, all of these uh, energy conserving devices on it that I, I have to buy because the EPA says you can't make a refrigerator anymore unless it's got those things on it so um, you know, that's, you know, first world problems, right? If you're dealing with the impact of some of these government energy choices in Ghana or in another similarly situated country, now you're stuck in an environment where you can't use liquefied petroleum gas canisters, which would have been a lot cleaner, not clean, clean, but a lot cleaner, uh, because somebody in, in France or the United States or Canada decided that you shouldn't be allowed to use fossil fuels. So de facto, you're left with burning uh, the waste that your uh, livestock drop in your, in your, um, on your land. Uh, that's, that's not an improvement, and it leaves people stuck in a situation where things are much, much uh, worse. Uh, I'll just say something brief about mercury emissions from coal-fired power plants, since I mentioned that at the very beginning. I referred to that uh, interview of um, RFK Jr. Um, I don't know a whole lot uh, uh, about him personally, except what I, uh, a few things I picked up here and there. But the concern there is, okay, well, uh, burning coal releases mercury into the atmosphere. The, atmos the uh, mercury precipitates and ends up being consumed by um, wild freshwater fish. And then if you are a pregnant woman and consume that fish, then that mercury can accumulate and it can cross the, <coughs> cross the placental barrier into, um, into the uh, baby and affect brain development. And so that's the concern. Um, now, if you eat freshwater farm-raised fish, which is a lot of our fish, it's not wild-caught fish that somebody threw a line into a river, it's, it's a farm, um, tilapia and catfish and things like that, uh, that has a pretty low um, level of methylmercury. And so the connection from U.S. power plants to fetal health is very, very tenuous. Um, Yellowstone National Park produces more natural mercury emissions than all eight of Wyoming's coal-fired power plants. Um, forest fires in the United States emit roughly the same amount of mercury as all power plants in the, in the United States. So just a little perspective on how much of this is actually being generated by human beings. Now, there are several problems with trying to regulate this kind of, go after this kind of, of problem with uh, regulation, one of which is, you know, if you, if, if you, uh, initiate a regulation that says, well, we, we're going to try to control mercury, it gets people worried about this. And now people say, well, I shouldn't eat fish because now that could have mercury in it. 
and then um, and then I can I can hurt my baby and and uh, in fact um, people might back into a worse problem. I mean, fish is a pretty good source of nutrition in several ways, and so you, you backed away from one problem that was actually quite trivial into another problem of, of inadequate nutrition that was, was actually more, more severe. Um, I will leave you with this, another one of my favorite pictures here. Uh, North and South Korea, doubtless many of you have seen this or some variation on this, but you can see all the lit up parts of South Korea there. Uh, North Korea is uh, a hero of energy conservation, right? <laughs> I mean, they're really going after excessive uh, uh, light pollution and electricity usage and so on. Um, so uh, anybody want to uh, move to North? Well, apparently the one guy did, <laughs> right? Ran across the border a couple of weeks ago. What was that about? I don't, never really, I guess he was in trouble with the, with the military and wanted to escape. Anyway, so uh, enough of that. All right, thanks very much. I'll be happy to talk with you afterward if you like.